This is always such a great event, the hallmark lecture of our academic year. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the 2011 Aquinas Lecture at the University of St. Thomas. I'm Dominic Aquila, the academic vice president of the University of St. Thomas. And I bring to you greetings from our president, Dr. Robert Ivany, who is in Manila tonight and this week uh, celebrating the 400th anniversary of the University of St. Thomas in Manila. It would have to be an event of that magnitude to keep him from being here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. You, um, this is a lecture each year when we celebrate the the patron saint of the University of St. Thomas. We typically have a mass uh, on this day and then a lecture. And these, this tradition goes back for quite a while in the history of the university. This year, as I was reflecting on the life of St. Thomas, I was reflecting on it with respect to something Pope Benedict had done this previous year in 2010. On June 29th, on the Feast of the Apostles of Peter and Paul, he called for a new evangelization and, in fact, created a new pontifical council for the new evangelization. And I began to think about St. Thomas Aquinas in that light. And there are Center for Thomistic Studies, which has dedicated world class scholars who study St. Thomas, can speak to so many aspects uh, as a layman in this world. I would speak to something that strikes me about the life of St. Thomas. And that is, he too was part of a new evangelization of his time. When you think about it, he, was, uh, he joined the Dominican order. And the Dominicans have been with us. We're so graced to have sisters of the Dominican order here. My pastor from Holy Rosary, the Dominican parish is here. But the Dominicans were formed in 1216 and St. Thomas joined them in 1244. Uh, a new order bent on a new kind of an evangelization. Both Franciscans and Dominicans were mendicant orders, a departure from what had been gone before. Uh, Thomas turned away from a more secure field among the Benedictines, a place where he could have easily had a, a flourishing career uh, as an academic in a retired cloistered life but he chose and deliberately chose against uh, great odds to become a Dominican. And aren't we all so much better for it? It was the hand of God for that because of his contributions to the intellectual life of the church as a doctor, foremost doctor of the church. I think of St. Thomas and all the new movements in the church that we experience today and their flowering and how much St. Thomas has to give to the new evangelization to the ideas that Thomas uh, celebrated and demonstrated in his own life, the, the qualities of synthesis of knowledge, one of the great things that we need to achieve, as uh, Howard Gardner has said in his book on what is the mind of the 21st century, it will be the mind that can synthesize. And can't St. Thomas tell us an awful lot about that? We're in for a great treat this evening with our lecturer, Dr. Peter Kraft, who many of you know. Um, and to introduce him and to introduce our honorees and inductees into uh, the Order of St. Thomas, I'd like to introduce uh, the director of the Center for Thomistic Studies, Dr. Mary Catherine Summers, who does extraordinary work in organizing this lecture every year. Dr. Mary Catherine Summers. It's our custom to begin this lecture with a prayer for philosophers, students of philosophy who might have died in the previous year. And we remember particularly at this time Dr. Ralph McInerney of Notre Dame, who was a member of our board and uh, who is greatly missed both as friend and as scholar. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. Amen. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. To mark its 25th year, the Center for Thomistic Studies initiated the Order of St. Thomas, 
to be awarded to persons who have testified to the incomparable value of the philosophy of St. Thomas in their writings, teachings, philanthropy, or way of life. Each recipient is presented with a medal bearing an image of Thomas Aquinas and the motto of the order, quantum potes tantum aude, dare to do all that you can. In the award's inaugural year, the center was privileged to honor Avery Cardinal Dulles and Mr. George Strake Jr. Tonight, we continue this pattern of awarding the medal both to internationally recognized scholars and to friends who have made our program possible. In making the award to Father Robert W. Crooker, CSB, we honor his contribution as a bazillion to the Renaissance in the study of St. Thomas Aquinas in North America, first at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies and then here at the Center for Thomistic Studies. We recognize as well the years of teaching and administration in Toronto and Houston and the generosity of spirit that knows no retirement. <laughs> Finally, we acknowledge with gratitude that Father Crooker functions for us as the true north on this university's intellectual compass. And so we present him with the Order of St. Thomas. In making this award to Michelle Malloy, we honor her service to Catholic higher education and more broadly to Catholic culture and education in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. We recognize particularly her tenure on this university's board of directors where she is currently chair. We are grateful for the care with which she has studied our traditions and we are heartened by the respect she has shown for our work of teaching and scholarship. Her wide-ranging service to her parish, to Incarnate Word Academy, the Charity Guild of Catholic Women, and to the Orders of Malta and the Holy Sepulchre has earned our admiration. And we are pleased, therefore, to present the Order of St. Thomas to Michelle Malloy. Peter Kreeft earned his A.B. from Calvin College and his M.A. and Ph.D. from Fordham University. He is currently Professor of Philosophy at Boston College, where he has been since 1965, and Distinguished Visiting Professor at the King's College in New York City. Like Newman, Kreeft read his way into the Catholic Church and has become one of its foremost apologists in the classical sense of the word. He gives us reasons, the sweet ones as well as the hard ones, for adhering to the faith. People love to hear him talk. He's clear, and although, as one young admirer put it, he comes across as a black and white guy, <laughs> he obviously sees himself as a teacher of moral absolutes and not their inventor. He also has a gift for the memorable line or image asked a question about cafeteria Catholics, and he immediately identified himself as a cafeteria Norseman, <laughs> loving thunder and hammers, but declining to live or die for Thor. <laughs> it is no wonder, then, that while he is said to hate computers, tens of thousands of people have listened to Dr. Kreef on YouTube, arguing for the existence of God or against abortion. There are also around 60 books to console, as Janet Smith put it, those who are not privileged to have Kreeft as a teacher in the flesh. Most recently, a novel, An Ocean Full of Angels, 
and a commentary on the relationship between Christianity and Islam, titled Between Allah and Jesus. These books written, are written by someone with no love for obscurity or footnotes, <laughs> impatient with philosophers who, whatever their virtues, do not know how to write, and unafraid of the designation popular, Kreeft has made it his business to render philosophical truths comprehensible and so engender a love of philosophy in his audience. The list of issues, philosophical and religious, on which he has written is formidable. The existence of God, moral relativism, virtue, suffering, logic and prayer, heaven and hell, angels and demons, and of course, hobbits. <laughs> Although he addresses the weighty issues, he does not find the small questions beneath his notice. Could we get bored in heaven? Impossible, because knowledge and love never get old, while all purely earthly activities eventually become boring, except perhaps surfing. <laughs> because as Dr. Kreef puts it, what we will do in heaven is to surf in God forever. <laughs> Tonight, we were to have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Kreef talk about Thomas Aquinas on sexuality. Has metaphysics anything to do with sex? But as Dr. Kreef informed me at dinner tonight, that was months ago. <laughs> so he has taken the privilege of the well-known and the well-spoken to change his title. We might, of course, Consider this an example of bait and switch. <laughs> I came to talk, I said I was going to talk about sex, but now I'm really going to talk about Thomistic personalism. <laughs> All right. So that is what we will hear him talk about tonight Thomistic personalism, a marriage made in heaven, hell, or Harvard? In gratitude for all he has done to make Thomas known and loved, we present the Order of St. Thomas to Dr. Peter Kreeft, and we invite him to take over the podium for whatever he would like to say on, <laughs> on whatever topic. Alas, I am totally abashed by my ADD. I, I thought it was during the late Jurassic Age that I said something about talking about sex tonight, and I totally forgot about it. And I had a friend who uh, got a PhD in philosophy and then went to get another PhD in psychology, and I asked him why, and he said, I discovered Freud, and Freud convinced me that sex is important, so I thought I'd better learn something about it. <laughs> And of course, the way you do that is to get a PhD. <laughs> well, this is a quasi-sexual performance tonight for the simple reason that I am picking up a fee for my work, which makes me what Socrates would call an intellectual prostitute. <laughs> and I thank the Center for Thomistic Studies for being my pimp. But absent-minded professors, unfortunately, even when they're not professing, are still absent-minded. And therefore, I have a topic worthy of the absent-minded professor, namely, Thomistic personalism, or personalistic Thomism, or if you want to do it in a single word, Thomersonalism. <laughs> Is this a marriage made in heaven, hell, or Harvard? The question writes Shakespeare sagely, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. On the other hand, if you marry a horse to a jackass, you only produce a mule, which in turn is sterile and produces no offspring. So when you marry Thomism with personalism, 
when you marry a pre-modern objective and metaphysical philosophy with a modern subjective and phenomenological one, do you get a marriage of true minds made in heaven or a mule made in hell or Harvard? In, in my spiritual geography, I locate Harvard about two-thirds of the way from heaven to hell. <laughs> Pope Benedict says it's made in heaven. Of course, this is his personal philosophical opinion, at most a theologumenon, as they say in the Eastern Orthodox Church, rather than a dogma. In his introduction to Christianity, he said that in the notion of a person developed in the church's theology of the Trinity lies concealed a revolution in man's view of the world, unquote. But Benedict is also a Thomist, as well as an Augustinian, which is one of the things Thomas himself was. And as Pope, he has called St. Thomas indispensable. Another great Pope and great philosopher, John Paul II, agrees. On the one hand, his encyclical, Fides et Ratio, is pure Thomism. On the other hand, his two great philosophical volumes, The Acting Person and Love and Responsibility, are classic examples of personalism and phenomenology. And he was not a schizophrenic. <laughs> Father Norris Clark, SJ, argues for the made in heaven option in his little classic, Person and Being, which he calls a creative retrieval and completion of Thomism. Father Clark came, claims to be, in other words, not the father with the shotgun, but the ontological obstetrician who delivers the personalist baby from the metaphysical mother by natural delivery. <laughs> His argument in a nutshell is that personalism and Thomism are eminently marriable philosophically because person and being are already married metaphysically. This little book is an extended metaphysical riff on Thomas's pregnant statement that person is that which is highest in all of nature. Summa Theological 129.3. Father Clark says, the person is not some special mode of being added on from the outside, so to speak. It is really nothing but the fullness of being itself when not restricted by the limitations proper to the material mode of being. To be fully without restriction is to be personal. That is the essential philosophical argument for the marriage. There is also a powerful theological argument implicit in the self-revealed divine name, I am. Historically, Thomistic metaphysics revealed the deepest depths of the am half of the divine name. But personalism claims to reveal the deepest depths of the I half and the unity of the two in God's being is the ultimate foundation for their unity in man's thinking. There are four possible answers to our question about the marriage. Yes, yes but, maybe, or no. In other words, accepting the marriage proposal, a conditional marriage with a signed prenuptial agreement, a trial engagement, or a refusal polite or impolite. We must say to the proposal of marriage by these matchmakers, either a hearty and enthusiastic yes, or a yes with qualifications and warnings, or a perhaps but it's too early to tell, or a sorry but this just won't work, which in turn may be either let us amicably agree to disagree, or a get thee behind me Satan, or a frankly my dear I just don't give a damn. <laughs> Now, since lecturing is a kind of interpersonal dialogue, since in this lecture you are not simply eavesdroppers on my private conversation with God, but the objects for whom the lecture is intended, I will address only Thomists rather than personalists. And I will evaluate personalism Thomistically rather than evaluating Thomism personalistically. I think that everyone in this room already agrees that personalism needs Thomism. What we wonder about is whether Thomism needs personalism. To be more specific, we all know that personalism spe specializes in the first half of each of the following ten dualities or polarities, and unfortunately is usually suspicious of the second half, which is the specialty of Thomism, and which we know is indispensable.
The 10 dualities are the concrete versus the abstract, the individual versus the universal, phenomenological description versus causal explanation, relation versus substance, experience versus reason, becoming versus being, epistemology versus metaphysics, psychology versus ethics, anthropology versus theology, and the subjective versus the objective. I think we all agree that any philosophy that treats only the second half of any of these pairs with disdain, suspicion, forgetfulness, or rejection is incomplete. What we are less sure of is, first, whether any philosophy that treats the first half of these pairs negatively or neglects that half is also radically incomplete. And secondly, if so, whether Thomism has been guilty of that neglect. And thirdly, if so, whether that neglect can be ended on the basis of Thomistic principles themselves, thus completing Thomism from within. That is my main question in this investigation. The answer of the Thomistic personalists is yes to all three questions. And they say that because of the first two answers, the marriage is necessary, and because of the third answer, the marriage is possible, and will be fruitful, not mulish. Of the ten polarities, I think the most fundamental is the last one, the relation between objectivity and subjectivity, between the objective orientation of pre-modern philosophy and the famous turn to the subject that made Descartes the father of all typically modern philosophers. I will take John Paul II and Father Clark as the two best defenders of the positive answer to our question, John Paul in anthropology and Father Clark in metaphysics. First, a few general quotations from John Paul about the need for the marriage. Since the questions are all pre-1978, I will call him Wojtyla. I mean no disrespect, Jesus often called Peter Simon even after changing his name. <laughs> as far back as 1961, Wojtyla presented a prophetic little 10-page paper entitled Thomistic Personalism at the Catholic University of Lublin calling for a synthesis of the insights of these two philosophies in particular, and of classical and modern philosophy in general. The main reason he gave for the synthesis was strategic, the need for a fuller answer to what he consistently maintained was the critical question of our time, what is man? For the crises in both church and world today are not about theology and its metaphysical foundations as they were in the early Christian centuries, but about ethics and its anthropological foundations. The premise of this argument, I think, is certainly true about the need. Does the conclusion necessarily follow that this marriage is necessary or even desirable or even possible? Should we add this synthesis to the already existing Thomistic synthesis, or should we pray, forgive us our syntheses? <laughs> or ask, who can forgive syntheses but God alone? The most basic argument for the synthesis of the metaphysical and the phenomenological is metaphysical, not phenomenological. It is that we are in ontological fact both subjects and objects, and we must therefore explore both dimensions and unite them as they are in fact united in ourselves. That is the argument from the nature of the human person. A second equally primordial argument comes from the nature of being that, as Aquinas says, personhood is that which is most perfect in all of nature. The ultimate reason for this, known to theologians through divine revelation, but not known to philosophers through reason alone, is that God, the creator and archetype of all being, is personal. That ultimate reality's name is I am, and therefore we must investigate the I, as modern personalism does, as well as the am, as Thomism does because they are equally primordial and equally absolute. Well, if this marriage is made in heaven, then both of the parties will benefit profoundly from it. As both faith and reason, both supernatural theology and natural philosophy benefited profoundly by the medieval marriage between the two. If Christians instead had chosen fideistic spinsterhood, and adopted the faith versus reason dualism of Tatian, Tertullian, Averroes, Caesar of Brabant, Scotus, Occam, Luther, or Kierkegaard, 
Then Justin Martyr, Augustine, John of Damascus, Anselm, Bonaventure, Aquinas, Newman, and even C.S. Lewis would all be out of work. <laughs> By the way, I wonder, is it significant that each of these synthesizers was a saint? I know Lewis has not yet been canonized on earth, but I take a patient heavenly view on that. <laughs> because I am both a Thomist and a male, I think of the Thomist as the groom and the personalist as the bride. And I wonder, should I marry this woman? <laughs> Good friends like Wojtyla and Clark tell me, yes, but I must test their advice. And since I am both a Thomist and a man, I will use abstract objective reasoning rather than concrete personal experience. <laughs> you all sound like my wife. <laughs> so I will explore a few key specific issues in metaphysics to see whether the marriage would benefit me as well as my potential spouse. That is to see whether I would receive additional metaphysical light by cozying up to mispersonality. Let's begin at the very center and summit of being, the act of existing. Both Wojtyla and Clark take the Gilsonian Maritanian existential Thomism point of view, which emphasizes the centrality of the to be, the act of existing, which Gilson calls the ultima thule of metaphysics. Gilsonian Thomism also insists on a firm epistemological realism rather than the semi-Kantian, semi-idealist transcendental Thomism, even though the latter at first seems more akin to the phenomenological method and the personalist themes which naturally leap into focus when we use that method, the viewpoint of imminent individual, concrete, personal, subjective consciousness rather than transcendent, universal, abstract, impersonal, objective reason. At the heart of Gilsonian existential Thomism is the primacy of the metaphysical principle of esse, to be, the act of existing. To call it the act of existence instead of the act of existing is misleading because it is an act, not a state. It is the supreme actuality and even essences are only potential with respect to it. It is first act and is always followed by and revealed by second act, that is action, operation, or activity. In all beings, as Aquinas says, operatio sequitur esse, operation follows existence. We know something is real by its activity. Even a rock acts to stop a hammer. Mere beings of reason, mere concepts, don't do that. Existence is the supreme perfection because it is actual with respect to everything else. This primacy of existence entails some shocking consequences. One of them is that essences are negative, not positive. Plato would be scandalized by that. Another is that God is existence, not essence. Rationalists are scandalized by that. A third is that God is therefore totally, literally, and actually present at the heart of every existing being. Deists are scandalized by that. Let us explore these three consequences just a little further. Essences are negative because they limit existence to this kind of existence. Existence of itself is unlimited. And therefore, it is correct to identify God with existence. That identification sounds to many people like a reduction of the personal to the impersonal, but it is not, because existing is not an impersonal thing or state or concept or universal abstracted from all things. It is the supreme actuality, dynamic and concrete. That is what God is. The crucial turn in understanding this signature theme of Thomistic metaphysics the sudden light that comes when the road of thought reaches the summit of the mountain is the realization that essay is not just an abstract fact, but a concrete act. Not just the state of being there, but the dynamic event that creates that state, though it is not necessarily a temporal act or a temporal event. In other words, it is more like energy than like matter, more like light than like any lit object. It is not an essence, it cannot be defined. It does not sit still for a portrait. 
this all the mystics knew, and Thomas was a mystic as well as a theologian. And in the end, his mysticism trumped even his theology. He could not finish the straw of the Summa. I think perhaps that was his supreme achievement, that single word. But beware, you too have a right to be silent and call all your words straw only after you have written the Summa. <laughs> At least nine-tenths of one. A third startling consequence is what Gilson calls the great syllogism. Major premise. Essay is that which is most intimate in each thing and that which is most profound in it because the act of being is actual with respect to all that there is in it. Minor premise. God is essay. Conclusion in Aquinas' own words. Therefore, God is in all things and that most intimately. What is God doing now? He's being. It's what bees do. <laughs> God is really and totally and personally present as the energizing center of every being, actualizing it from within. Even the devil, who must rage eternally in hopeless ontological resentment against his dependency on God for his very existence. This is not pantheism, because the very thing that makes God totally present also makes him totally transcendent. The fact that he is infinite existence, transcending all finite essence. As light actualizes all colors only because it transcends all colors. Or as the surface of a mirror reflects all opaque objects because it is not an opaque object. Or better yet, as thought makes present all forms, represents or represents all forms because it is itself formless. So God actualizes all essences, all potentialities, because he transcends them by being pure actuality. And therefore, the essence of theological sanity and the essence of sanctity are identical, the practice of the presence of God. For the God of true theology and the God who is always present, not absent, is the same. And the practice of true philosophy is the conformity of thought to reality. Although sanity and sanctity are identical not by abstract logical and philosophical definition or by concrete phenomenological and psychological description, they are identical ontologically. Thomas is above all a theologian and a metaphysician. And as the supreme signature theme of Thomism is the primacy of the active existence in metaphysics and the identification of God with existence in theology, only God's essence is existence. In all creatures, essence and existence are really distinct. So the connection of this absolutely central Thomistic theme with personalism is that this God is personal. God is three persons. That's the central dogma of Christianity. Therefore, existence, when infinite, is personal. Nothing can be less than a person unless it is limited by a finite essence. So as Father Clark says, personality is not an accidental addition to existence. It is what existence is of itself when let alone, so to speak. Gabriel Marcel, in his essay on the ontological mystery, made what I think is one of the most startling statements in the entire history of philosophy. He said that the true introduction to ontology must be the study of sanctity. Imagine the rage and scandal that statement would provoke in an atheist ontologist like Nietzsche, who was really an atheist oncologist, <laughs> diagnosing the death of being as well as the death of God. But Marcel's startling identification is not a confusion, but logically follows from just two premises. First, that the saint is the human person at his most human, in his perfection, the perfection of his personhood, being what he was meant to be, freed from the dehumanizing of sin. Second premise, that personhood is the perfection of being, just as sanctity is the perfection of personhood. Therefore, sanctity is the perfection of being. Like existence, personhood is not an essence. We all know this instinctively. Ordinary language distinguishes the pronouns who and what. 
person and essence or nature. We ask human beings, whose essence is obviously only human, who they are, assuming we know their what, their species, their essence. But when we meet Jesus, Buddha, or Mr. Spock, we ask what they are. Are they only human or something else? Thus ordinary, by the way, the three of them gave different answers to that question. <laughs> Thus ordinary language implicitly teaches us that personhood or who-ness is not the same as species being or essence or what-ness. Well, then there are only two possibilities. If it's not essence, it's either existence or it's nothing. In other words, it's either Thomism or materialism. That is the most central metaphysical theme uniting Thomism and personalism. That is the Thomistic hook that holds the personalistic fish. A second related and corollary theme in Thomistic metaphysics is that, in Thomas's own words, it is the nature of every actuality to communicate itself insofar as it is possible. Hence, every agent acts insofar as it exists in actuality. In other words, second act always follows first act. Activity always follows actuality. It is the very nature of all being to communicate itself to another, to relate to the other, to give itself to the other. Jacques Maritain calls this ontological generosity. Fire ignites the other. Light illumines the other. Thought knows the other. Love seeks the good of the other. This is the Thomistic vision that inspired Dante to write the greatest line in the greatest poem in the world about the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. That's not just gravity, that's God. Thomistic personalism unifies the three philosophically profoundest predicates we can predicate of God. The first of these is being, the burning bushes I am, God naming himself, not this or that being, but being itself. And remember that being, for Thomas, is first of all existence. The second name from the same source is I, God is person, three persons. This name implied in the same name spoken in the burning bush was explicated or unpacked, so to speak, some 2,000 years later by the Holy Spirit to the church in her Trinitarian and Christological creeds with their key distinction between person and nature. The third name, incarnated and acted on by Christ himself and enunciated by St. John's first epistle, is love. Because God is not just one person, but three, he is not just a lover, but complete love itself. The lover, the beloved, and the loving. So God is being, God is person, God is love. Nothing profounder can be said of God. But these three are one because of the prior revelation to Moses, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. Since it is the one and the same God who is being, existence, and who is person, and who is love, therefore these three are one in God, that is, in their perfection. These are three names for the same reality. There is in God a kind of philosophical circumcision or mutual indwelling of names, somewhat like the circumcision of persons in the Trinity. And this oneness can be shown by the following circular seven-step equation. First, God is being. Second, being is the act of existing. Third, the act of existing is the supreme actuality, first act. It's the chutzpah to stand outside nothingness. Fourth, actuality is always also activity, whether temporal or eternal. Operatio sequitur esse. Real being, unlike merely mental being, always does something, always makes a difference to something else. Fifth, this difference is always made to another being, and therefore activity always implies relationality or relationship. And this relationship is always self-communication, self-giving. Everything diffuses itself. Everything has ontological generosity. Sixth, that is what love is. Therefore, all being is a form of loving. Seventh, love is the essence of personal sanctity. Love is every person's telos and fulfillment. Love is the purpose of personhood. Seventh, this 
last and seventh element is equated with the first one. God is love. So the equation is circular. Now, I know that these equations are not mathematical and simply reversible. God is love does not mean the same thing as love is God. But love, unlimited by time or finite essence, is indeed God. Just as existence, not limited by finite essence, is God. Both personhood and love are not external additions to being, but that which being is of itself when freed from all external restrictions. And that is why Marcel is absolutely right when he says that the secret to ontology is sanctity. Scratch the surface of being and you eventually find love at its heart. Do some metaphysical spelunking. Explore the depths of the cave of being and you find there a saint, a little Christ. So the center of the universe is neither the earth nor the sun. It is the sun, capital S-O-N. But ever since nominalism and the end of the Middle Ages, there has been an unfortunate division between speculative and practical theology, between metaphysics and spirituality, between ontology and sanctity. I think it is time for the estranged siblings to return home and reconcile. It is time to write books like Augustine's Confessions again. For metaphysics at its profoundest depth or highest summit can and should coincide with sanctity spirituality, even mysticism. Metaphysics should take on a personal dimension and challenge if the search for the depths of being is seen as the work not merely of a disembodied impersonal curiosity, but also the work of the desire for personal fulfillment and salvation as the response to the pull from the source of all existence. Just as the ultimate alpha and the ultimate omega are one, and as our first cause and our last end are one, so our ultimate causal explanation and our ultimate personal fulfillment are one. Thus, as Father Clark says at the end of his great metaphysics text, The One and the Many, metaphysics turns out to be not just the abstract intellectual quest for the fullness of truth, but also a hidden existential encounter with the transcendent source himself. Metaphysics, like life, is not the flight of the alone to the alone, but a dialogue with God, who is a trinity of persons in love. In addition to this central theme, there are a number of satellite themes that are essential to the union of Thomism and personalism. But because Thomas himself never explicitly developed them, the traditional Thomist may well balk at them. One of the most important of these is the notion of the individual person as not merely an Aristotelian substance with form and matter, whose principle of individuation is matter, though this is a true and a necessary foundation for subsequent higher definitions of a person. Or even, second, the richer Boethian notion of an individual substance of a rational nature whose individuality consists in being undivided in itself but divided from everything else, which is also true and foundational but insufficient. Or even, in the third place, the still richer Thomistic notion of a substantial rational soul with powers of intellect and will substantially united to an animal body, which is also true and foundational, but also not sufficient. What else is needed? That a person is one whose individuality is interior, the whole dimension of the inner life, and which is also essentially relational. The I is just as relative to the I-thou relation as that relation is to the I, both in us and in God. The interiority or inner life of the individual is relational because it is a life of self-consciousness and self-mastery, or freedom, dominus sui, as Aquinas calls it. When we explore this dimension of subjectivity, we find the principle of personal individuation as distinct from the individuation of non-personal substances to be more than matter and more than substantiality we find the notion of person as essentially relational as well as substantial. I think we find this essential relationality in three dimensions, the relation to others, the relation to self, and the relation to God. First, we actualize our self-identity only in relation to others. 
individuality and relationality are actualized together, not apart. Neither ever exists without the other. Second, the self becomes a self only by relation to itself, by self-consciousness and self-mastery or freedom. Third, we become selves only in relation to God, which is also not an addition, but an aspect of the very essence of the person. We become a self first only by being created by our Alpha in his image, and second, by attaining our final end by union with our Omega. Until heaven, we are broken, incomplete selves, embryonic persons, and this whole little universe is only our womb. The need to explore the reality of this personal subjectivity and its three relationships, which Aquinas rarely does explicitly, is the reason for personalism. For subjectivity is the dimension of human personhood which is irreducible to objectivity, just as much as objectivity is irreducible to subjectivity. Wojtyla says in his essay, Subjectivity and the Irreducible in the Human Being, that, quote, the personalist type of understanding the human being is not the antinomy of the cosmological type, but rather its complement. And the reason for the need of a personalist type of understanding, he says, is that, quote, we must pause at whatever is irreducible, whatever is unique and unrepeatable in each human being, by virtue of which he or she is not just a particular human being, an individual of a certain species, but this personal subject. Only then do we get a true and complete picture of the human being, unquote. In other words, we have a subjective inner life as well as an objective life, and a complete philosophy cannot neglect either one. But to explore this subjective inner life, we need a different method than the objective or cosmological method, which is based on abstraction of universal forms from particular substances. Wojtyla criticizes those Thomists who would reject the need for this additional method as follows. He writes, the traditions of philosophical anthropology would have us believe that we can, so to speak, pass right over this interior, irreducibly subjective dimensions, that we can cognitively omit them by means of an abstraction that provides us with a species definition of the human being as a being, or in other words, a cosmological type of reduction. Homo equals animal rationale. But the irreducible signifies that which is essentially incapable of reduction, that which cannot be reduced but can only be disclosed or revealed. Lived experience of a person essentially defies reduction. This does not mean that it eludes our knowledge. It only means that we must arrive at the knowledge of it differently namely by a method or means of analysis that merely reveals and discloses its essence. The method of phenomenological analysis allows us to pause at lived experience as the irreducible." Unquote. These two methods are joined by their common object, the human self. The personal subject and the ontological subject are the same. In fact, the substantiality of the metaphysical subject is the necessary ontological foundation for the relationality of the phenomenological subject, because only substances can be in relation. Just as many Thomists resist the personalist's point about relation, most personalists and phenomenologists resist the Thomistic point about substance, and indeed the broader point about the need for metaphysics and abstraction. These two families of Romeo and Juliet try to keep them apart, but perhaps they are destined for each other. A corollary of this vision is a metaphysical foundation for John Paul's theology of the body, which is the church's response to the most life-changing revolution in the last 2,000 years, namely the sexual revolution. The ontological ground for John Paul's philosophy of sexuality are the double nature of the person as both substance and relation, both in itself and toward others, both introverted and extroverted, plus the equiprimordiality and equal dignity of receptivity and activity, and thus of femininity and masculinity, grounded in the Trinity itself. Jesus was the most perfectly masculine man who ever lived, yet also the most totally receptive to his Father's mind and will. He was the most cosmically feminine, the total conformist. 
He came into the world not to do his own will, but the will of the Father. Yet he was also the most active, the most creative, and the most original man who ever lived. It's not either or, it's both and. Well, what we have explored, sketchy as it was, should convince us, I think, that of the four possible answers to the proposal of marriage between Thomism and personalism, a simple no is not the right one. But we must look at the objections to the marriage before we decide to say yes. Perhaps the answer should be yes but, or maybe. There are at least ten such objections. Objection one. There is no need for a further synthesis. Thomism is complete. The reply is that no philosophical system in this world is complete. And that Thomism does not claim to be a complete system. It is a system, but it is an open system, not a closed one, like that of modern rationalists. It is essentially a dialogue with all philosophies. That is manifested in the very form of the Summa article, which is a systematized dialogue, and in the fact that Aquinas almost always answers objections, not by simple denials, but by distinctions, and tries to affirm and preserve the true aspect of every objection. Second, Thomism is not incompatible with further synthesis because Thomism is itself a synthesis of Plato and Aristotle, of theology and philosophy. In fact, Thomas is history's greatest synthesizer, rivaled only by Hegel, that paragon of brilliant but insane absent-mindedness, <laughs> as Aquinas is the paragon of sane common sense. Selected chickens from all previous philosophical chicken coops, except the sophists, come to roost in Thomas's barn and lay eggs for his omelet. <laughs> as Thomas assimilated and synthesized as many pre-Thomistic truths as possible, Thomists today should assimilate and synthesize as many post-Thomistic truths as possible, because all truth is compatible with all other truth, since all truth is ultimately both from a single and to a single divine source and end. Objection two. Historically, every attempt to synthesize Thomism with any other philosophy has always failed. Synthesis has a terrible track record. Gilson himself has refuted both early modern rationalistic essentialistic Thomism and 20th century transcendental Thomism by returning from all neo-Thomisms to what he calls paleo-Thomism, authentic original Thomism. So if all neo-Thomist syntheses in history have deformed, misunderstood, and misinterpreted Thomas, is it not likely that personalistic Thomism will do the same? Reply, first, it is not any neo-Thomism, but precisely Gilsonian paleo-Thomism that the Thomistic personalists want to synthesize with personalism. And secondly, the historical failure of past syntheses, in fact, does not prove the failure of all synthesis in principle. So the jury is out on that one. Objection three. Perhaps some th synthesis is acceptable, but this synthesis is not because it is alien. It is an imposition, not a growth, not an organic completion of Thomism from within. These two philosophies are just too different to marry. The old body will not accept the new organ. The marriage is a monster, half man, half beast, like a centaur, not a hypostatic unity like Christ, fully divine and fully human. It is a fundamentalist Muslim marriage rather than a Christian marriage, a subjugation of one partner, a slavery of the object to the subject. Phenomenology, in other words, is not a friend but a foreign spy. Phenomenological Thomism is really Kantian Thomism in disguise. Reply number one, no it is not. Gilson, Maritain, <laughs> well, sometimes simple answers are the best ones. That's what converted Malcolm Muggeridge, you know. He had become an Anglican and didn't become a Catholic and Mother Teresa kept getting on him about it. And one day he was walking with her around her hospital and uh, she said, uh, Malcolm, uh, you're a good man. Why don't you see your way to come all the way into Rome? And Malcolm said, well, Mother, I'll refute you with your own words. I guess God looks down on me and says, well, he's a good man, and I need some good men outside my church, too. And Mother Teresa, Malcolm says, refuted me with three words. No, he doesn't. <laughs> what can you say? 
No sane person has ever been able to say anything back to Mother Teresa. <laughs> Jolson, Maritain, Ratzinger, Wojtyla, and Clark are all firmly Jolsonian existential Thomists and realists. Wojtyla criticizes not only Husserl's later turn towards idealism, but even Husserl's initial epoche as tending to idealism in the acting person. Second reply, the two philosophies are indeed very different, but difference does not preclude marriage. It makes it possible. That is why there is no such thing as a marriage between two men or two women. Objection four. Some differences are synthesizable, but others are not. A synthesis between pre-modern objectivism and modern subjectivism is not. All truth is compatible with all other truth, but subjectivism and objectivism are not both true because they are contradictory. Truth is either subjective or objective, either dependent on consciousness or independent of consciousness, unless the law of non-contradiction has been abrogated. Reply, of course truth is objective. Neither personalism nor phenomenology are necessarily subjectivistic. To explore subjectivity is not to be a subjectivist. Subject and object are joined in all experience. Why should they not be joined in a complete philosophy? Wojtyla even argues that it is phenomenology itself which discovers the falsehood of subjectivism. I discover by experience that I am not simply pure consciousness, but rather an individual substance. Objection five. The two philosophies are not synthesizable because one is based on abstraction and the other rejects abstraction. You can't both be abstract and not abstract at the same time. The abstract is universal, the concrete is individual. Because its method is concrete rather than abstract, phenomenolo phenomenology deliberately refuses all metaphysical presuppositions and starts with conscious lived experience of the individual self instead. My reply is, it's true, you can't do both at the same time, but that doesn't mean you can't do both. And second, phenomenology does not need to reject abstract metaphysics any more than science needs to reject religion or religion needs to reject science. And third, Thomism is itself concrete, though objectively rather than subjectively. It is an Aristotelian soft empiricism, not a Platonic essentialism or a Spinozistic rationalism. On the other hand, phenomenology itself is abstract because it is reflective. We do not directly experience the reflection on experience. Objection six, phenomenology begins with the self, with consciousness, with man. Thomism begins with being and with God. This modern anthropocentrism is a kind of philosophical idolatry. Descartes substitutes the human I am for the divine I am. That is humanism. Reality is not anthropocentric, but theocentric. The reply is that Thomistic personalism does not begin with Descartes. It begins with Thomas, or rather with God. It quite agrees with the Southern Baptist preacher who said that everything God revealed to us in the Bible can be summarized in two points, in four words. One, I'm God. Two, you're not. <laughs> The starting point and point of view of Thomistic personalists are, is Thomistic, not modern. It's not from a modern point of view that they turn to Thomism. It is from a Thomistic point of view that they turn to modern personalism in metaphysics and to phenomenology in method because they want to synthesize all valid post-Thomas insights as Thomas himself synthesized all pre-Thomas insights. They want to cannibalize parts of Descartes or Pascal or Hegel or Kierkegaard or Husserl or Heidegger or Scheler to feed to Thomas, to complete Thomas, not vice versa. Objection seven, does this synthesis claim to solve the puzzle of the Gnosio ontological circle or does it stay endlessly within this circle? The puzzle is this, whenever we think of being, being is the object of thought, is surrounded by thought is an example of intelligibility, thinkability. But whenever thought exists,
thought is an example of existence, of being, of objective reality. So being is encompassed by thinking, and thinking is encompassed by being. This gnosio-ontological circle must be broken somewhere. We must begin either with the objective, as pre-Cartesian philosophy does, or with the subject, as Descartes and his successors do. So one of the two must be prior to the other. My reply is that this is quite true. And in objective reality, the subject is relative to the object, not vice versa. That is, the truths about subjectivity are objective truths, not subjective truths. Thomistic personalism is realism, not idealism. But since what is first in intention is often last in execution, and since we usually think about ends before we think about means, and since what is first in objective reality is usually last in human thought, since human thought naturally moves backward rather than forward, from effect to cause, therefore it is natural and legitimate to begin with subjectivity in our method, even though it is not legitimate to posit the priority of subjectivity in reality. Objection 8. The synthesis is a confusion of categories. We may indeed need an exploration of subjectivity, but this is not philosophy. It is called psychology. The reply is that there is a philosophical psychology as well as a clinical and an empirical psychology, just as there is a philosophical cosmology as well as scientific cosmology, and a philosophical theology as well as a biblical theology, and a philosophy of history as well as a history of philosophy. Neither one excludes the other. Objection 9. Even though the subjective methods do not necessarily replace or deny objectivity in principle, they usually do in practice. Almost all personalists hate and fear metaphysics, abstraction, causal explanation, and the very idea of substance. In other words, it's like technology. In principle, it's good and human, but in practice, it almost always destroys its opposite, nature. Reply, the parallel with technology is instructive. After the technological alternative to nature was developed, nature was more deeply appreciated. The ancients did not love, but feared mountains, storms, oceans, comets, and lions. We are able to love them. Why? We have technology. Technology offers us the opportunity to forget and destroy nature, but it also offers us the opportunity to appreciate it better as death offers us the opportunity to appreciate life. We appreciate most things by contrast. Masculinity and femininity are the obvious example. The fact that some men hate and fear women and some women hate and fear men is an aberration, not a necessity. So the same can be true of these two philosophies. Objection 10. Phenomenology and personalism are both vague and dull. No phenomenologist or personalist has ever written clearly. <laughs> this is no accident. Not writing clearly is always caused by not thinking clearly. <laughs> Reply number one, I take this as a very serious objection. And therefore, <laughs> and therefore, perhaps it's time to change that. And no one could change it better than a Thomist. So let someone write a personalist summa. Reason number two, there's some reason for that obscurity. It's the same reason the Holy Spirit seems more obscure and vague and dull to us than the other two persons of the Trinity, until we actually experience his reality and presence. We quite naturally think of the Father as outside us, the Son as beside us, and the Spirit as inside us. And the indwelling of the spirit makes God what Marcel calls a mystery rather than a problem to us. We can't get it clear because we can't objectify it. And that is certainly preeminently true of subjectivity itself. Mysteries in the Marcellian sense are not capable of clear or definitive solutions because they all include subjectivity. They all encroach on their own data, as Marcel puts it. They are questions we cannot abstract ourselves from. We cannot solve the problem of evil because we are the problem of evil and the psychosomatic unity and the freedom of the will. The Copenhagen interpretation of Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle may have been wrong about Adams, but I think it was right about us. 
the act of observing this object interferes with any clear perception of a determinate position or velocity in the object. And that is as it must be. Because our eye is the image of the divine eye, which is the eternal mystery, in both the subject can never be wholly objectified. That cow can never be milked dry. How threatening and boring that would be. In fact, that's almost the definition of hell. Well, in conclusion, I have presented my thesis, defined it, defended it, and answered objections to it. What is my conclusion, my response to the marriage proposal? My answer is not that we should marry Thomism and personalism, nor that we should not, but that our image of the marriage was wrong. It should have been the image of a pregnant woman. We can find personalism already hiddenly present in Thomism like an unborn baby, and it is now Advent in the calendar of philosophical Kairos, and high time for a nativity and an epiphany. <laughs> so my answer to my original question is an ecstatic yes, and a prediction that this marriage, or rather this pregnancy, is not only made in heaven, but is destined to be so fruitful on earth that it will be the single greatest piece of philosophical progress since the 13th century. In previewing and forecasting this birth, Father Clark and John Paul II have both been like Albert the Great. I pray that one of you who hears this lecture will be the new Aquinas. Dr. Krepp. Uh I, I'm not standing to announce myself as the new Aristotle <laughs> or Thomas. Uh, the problem in Roe v. Wade was the meaning of what a person is. And Blackman indicated that n there is no satisfactory answer to it. But at the same time, a person enters the Constitution as a term to indicate what you indicate, that is, that this is a being of, of transcendent worth, and uh, uh, that's why it is deserving of every legal protection. If, if what you say tonight is true, how do we deal uh, with the ignorance professed by people like Justice Blackman? There are certain pieces of ignorance that are so massive that the only possible <laughs> answer to them is to turn your back on them. Cast not your pearls before swine. That is not a serious argument. Nor is Justice Anthony Kennedy's famous mystery passage a serious argument. If taken literally, that is idolatry. Uh, at the heart of liberty is the right to define for oneself the meaning of life and the mystery of existence, which means, God, move over. You're sitting in my seat. That's just absurd. <laughs> Some, some, some things are staggeringly irrefutable. Like Nietzsche's, why truth? Why not rather untruth? Staggering. Well, if you can't recognize a demon when you see it, you're hopeless. <laughs> I think, I think some, some ideas require not philosophers but exorcists to refute them. <laughs> My question was, I know there's a difficulty in thinking God is evil since, at least the Christian God, since he would give us the faculties of reasoning and, and conscience, of course, he would give us that ability. So I believe God is wholly good versus a mixture of good and evil or pure evil. So I was wondering, what are your reasons for believing God is wholly good? Jesus. Any other questions? <laughs> If he's not wholly good, then Jesus was the stupidest fool in the history of the world. Dr. Creep, I have a question about Catholic education. And um, my question is, we're, we're blessed in our archdiocese to have a cardinal, Donardo, and our superintendent of Catholic education who are moving to include children with disabilities in Catholic schools. And as we appeal to the larger 
Catholic community, I was wondering, is it a moral issue to include children with disabilities, I have a daughter with Down syndrome, in our Catholic schools, and is it um, a pro-life issue? Yes, yes, and yes. Of course. Uh, this is part of the social gospel, which is not an addition, but an aspect of the gospel. Uh, Jesus said very clearly, whatever you do to one of the least of these, my brethren, you do to me. Meditate on that every day. Well, I found myself thinking of the Lord of the Rings, a, basic, a, a, a fully a world in which... Everything makes world me think about the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> God, well, in which God is fully present, in which it is, it, it is truly a Thomistic world, and yet you can see the personal in which how, how does this affect and how is this lived by, by real people. I just, uh, it seems like that, that might be a, a, a very promising example of, of what can be done with the marriage that you, you spoke of. Uh, where do you find it in the Lord of the Rings? That is a masterpiece of realistic literature, uh, but it's not modern, it's pre-modern. Oh, yes. But, but, the, but the, you know, exploring the, char the characteristics, the, the individual characters and the way Tolkien did, it, wouldn't, it, it doesn't quite resemble, say, yes, the Iliad. Yes, that's, or that's the, a good point, because what great literature, what all great literature really does is uh, not take two philosophical approaches and methods which are by nature abstract and reflective and, and somehow put them together or keep them apart, but depicts the human life as it really is that in fact synthesizes the both. So each of these characters has a real inner life and when you read the story you enter into the inner life of these characters in a very modern way and yet you see them from a God's eye point of view, the cosmological uh, big picture. Exactly. So in that sense, story is profounder than philosophy. The Bible is not a philosophy, it's a story. It produces philosophies, and philosophy is necessary to, to fully understand it, but it's fundamentally a story, like life. Dr. Crave, yeah. problem subject to the Lord of the Ring, does it seem like when you said liberty is that much to approach the truth, it seems like it came to me that the liberty would seem to be like the ring in Lord of the Rings. If you have the way... You have a certain power that is opposed to God. And you're supposed to, in order you're supposed to destroy the ring, and the liberty associated with this flag is diametrically opposed to truth and the true freedom. I mean, would it be associated with license rather than true freedom? That's one of the great lies of the devil. Uh, Augustine uh, refuted that when he distinguished two meanings of freedom, liberum arbitrium and libertas. Liberum arbitrium is simply the free will or free choice that is a power. Uh, and is indeterminate. Uh, libertas is the, the, the identical ultimately with what he calls peace, that is our attaining our telos, our successful completion of our end, uh, liberation from sin. So uh, the first and lower freedom is a means to the end of the greater and higher freedom. And when you attain that freedom, uh, you destroy the ring because the ring is the misuse of the lower freedom. So what you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, Dr. Kreef, the ring is a misuse of true liberty. What we call liberty in the flag and the Constitution is a misuse no, of No, the ring is a misuse of the lower freedom, which is expressed in power, and a refusal to attain true liberty. The devil does not have liberty. I agree. I was getting confused. Mm -hmm. That's it. But we, we, we are here in America very confused about the word freedom because it has two aspects. On the one hand, it, it has a higher meaning and it means liberty. And that's wonderful. The truth shall make you free. But it also sometimes is simply confused with power. Uh, if I am in jail or if I am paralyzed or if I am ignorant, I do not have power and also I do not have freedom. So that's staying on the lower level of freedom and refusing to look at it in terms of the higher, as a means to the higher. Uh, what's the difference between freedom and power? 
if you don't have that higher notion of freedom as liberty, uh, there's no answer to that question. Freedom is just the power to do as I please. That's a very dangerous notion of freedom. Yes, li liberty versus license, right. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, what a pity. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm here representing the younger crowd. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder. <laughs> and oh, I've seen the dinosaurs come and go. <laughs> and this topic is, that you were discussing is really fascinating and wonderful. But just to simplify this, how does it relate to us? How, does it, how can Catholic youth... You take this and take it into our lives, okay? Because by by simultaneously looking at, habitually looking at, every person that you meet uh, with two eyes, not just one, uh, the objective eye. What is the truth of this person? What does God say this person is? What does the church tell me this person is? Uh, let me have a road map. Let me have light. Secondly, with the subjective eye. This person and I are both persons. We both have an inner life. Can I enter into that other inner life? Can I see th not just that person as an object, but can I enter into that person and see through his or her eyes as a subject? This is why I think we need lives of the saints and, and great literature, because you can't really be moral without having that kind of empathy and imagination. Uh, but the fundamental moral principle is certainly the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, which, which is another way of saying, if you were in his shoes, how would you feel? Well, that's the empathetic or subjective dimension, and that's absolutely necessary. And also the objective dimension is absolutely necessary because you need light and a roadmap. And that's why God gave us two eyes and not one. Can't do any more?